Well, good morning, church. It's great to be with you this cooler July Sunday morning. A uh, couple of things to tell you about. Um, first of all, I want to welcome those of you who are from the uh, Lutheran Marriage Encounter. I know we have some people here from there. Great to have you with us. Uh, second of all, I want to let you know about a couple of things coming up. The next two Saturday night worship services are on location. This coming Saturday, we're at Dow Diamond for the Loons game. If you haven't gotten your tickets, get those tickets. It's going to be a lot of fun. Gates open at 5. We'll have worship there on the field or in the stands at 5.30. The game's at 7, and then there's fireworks following. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And then two weeks from yesterday, so the next Saturday, we'll be out at Rethke Park in Thomas Township having art in the park. A lot of creative fun with worship outdoors in the park at 6 o'clock. So that's the next two Saturdays. Uh, you're welcome to join there. Uh, you can come both days, Saturday and Sunday. Be fine. So, uh, but want to see you out there. Um, we are continuing with our summer series, working through the Ten Commandments. We are on the Third Commandment, which uh, for any of you who are not lifelong Lutherans, that is... Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Uh, other Christians count differently than we do. Uh, the Lutherans and the Catholics count one way, and other Protestants count another way. But we are talking about the Sabbath this morning. Uh, we celebrate Holy Communion this morning. You can do that on the floor or at the communion rail. It is great to be with you. I'm Pastor Eric. Mr. Koip is here with me this morning doing liturgy. Let's stand up and greet one another.
morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was glad when they said to me, Better is one day in your courts. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Out of his great love for us, God has given us his commandments to guide us into right relationship with him and with our neighbors. In the third commandment, God reminds his people how we are to love, worship, and relate to him. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise the preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and the and Let us now examine our hearts as we reflect on this commandment, confessing our rebellion and disobedience and asking God for his mercy and forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we confess Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us, and for His sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on His name, He gives the power to become the children of God and has promised them His Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Glory be to God. 
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is our true Sabbath rest. Help us to keep each day holy by receiving his word of comfort, that we may find our rest in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated for the reading of God's perfect and inspired word. Our first reading today is from Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning at the 12th verse. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day, this is the word of the Lord. Our second reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 4, beginning with the ninth verse. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence Draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. We stand. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Considers the lily, uh, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, 
in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious about anything, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the gospel of our Lord. Having heard God's word, we are bold to confess our faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, God and His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things You may be seated, and while you are seating, I uh, would like to invite the kids forward for a message with Pastor Eric, and while they're coming forward, I would like to welcome everybody online. Glad you could join us this morning for the comfort of wherever it is that you happen to be today, although it's quite comfortable here in Saginaw today. Good morning, everybody. Our uh, elder Don Albrecht tells me it's been over 110 degrees in Arizona for the last three days, so be happy you're here. Good morning, everybody. How you doing, ladies? How you doing? Good. Good. Anybody ever get tired? You guys ever get tired? What do you do when you get tired? Sleep. What? Sleep. Sleep. What if it's the middle of the day? Sleep. Sleep? You take a nap in the middle of the day, I find that hard to believe. Most parents would love for their kids your age to take a nap during the middle of the day. What else can you do besides sleep? What if you are doing work? What if you're doing a job? What if you have to be um, outside and you're uh, running the steamroller in the backyard? What do you do when you get tired? Take a break when you're riding, driving the steamroller in the backyard? Okay. All right. Yep. Have a snack? All right. Yeah. Take a break. Have a snack? Absolutely. What about, what if you're tired because uh, people just aren't being very nice to you and you're just kind of tired of dealing with other people? What can you do? Do you ever, you ever feel that way? No. You don't ever feel like you just want to be alone for a little bit? What? Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, I want to look at the Bible and what God says. And Jesus says, come to me, everybody who's tired and worn out. How can we 
How can we go to Jesus when we're tired? How do we do that? Yeah, Christian. Pray. Yeah. Yep. Meditate. Meditate. Awesome. What's meditate mean? You don't know? Om. No, no, no. To meditate. To meditate is to read something from the Bible and just think about it. Be quiet and be still. Yeah, to think about God. In fact, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. And so that's a kind of like a meditation or a prayer where we just sit and be still and be with God. And He will help us renew our strength. In fact, the Bible says that too, that He will renew your strength. So God is our rest. So I know this summer, you guys are getting some rest from school. Are you playing a lot? You been swimming? You're not playing a lot? No? Yeah, did you get a job? No? All right. Well, while you're out this summer, if you're playing too hard or mom and dad got you working too hard, if you need to take a break, take a break and spend it with Jesus. That's a good way to get some rest. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you are our rest and that you renew our strength. When we get tired and worn out, help us to remember that you listen and we can tell you that we're tired and you will help us to feel better and give us more energy because you love us. Thank you for being with us, God, and thank you for reminding us that you are with us. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can go off to summer Bible camp, whatever it's called. I can never remember. Campfire Kids, there it is. Christ's Campfire Kids, thank you so much for coming up.
grace, mercy, peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The third commandment, I think in many ways, is the forgotten commandment. We remember that we're not supposed to murder or adulter or steal or lie or covet or have any other gods. But what does the Sabbath mean to us? I had a conversation with one of our members last night. We were just talking about, reminiscing about how businesses used to be closed on Sundays. You couldn't buy alcohol on Sundays, things like that. And many of those things are left in our past. The Baptists, the old school Baptists, like my grandparents, would spend all day Sunday at church. They would get up in the morning, they would go to early church, they would go to Bible study, they might go home for lunch, but then they'd come back and have a potluck dinner and have more service at night. Sunday was a Sabbath. It was completely devoted to being at church. And then, of course, there's the issue of, well, what is the Sabbath? Should we celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday? the last day of the week? Are we doing something wrong by celebrating worship on Sundays? Well, first of all, let's look at the text of the commandment which says to remember or honor the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Moses, in our passage from Deuteronomy, now, I chose the Deuteronomy passages for the commandments rather than the Exodus ones Because Deuteronomy is a sermon by Moses. And so Moses expounds on or expands on the commandments. There's a little bit more text in Deuteronomy to give us a little bit more understanding and context. And he ties the concept of the Sabbath to two major aspects of God's work. The first is creation. It ties it back to creation when God created the world in six days And on the seventh day, he rested. The Hebrew verb is actually ceased or stopped. On the first day, he created, he created. On the second day, he created, he created. He created, he created, and then he ceased. He stopped creating. And so it reminds God's people of God's creative work. And something that it reminded the Israelites of that I don't think we think of very often is that God created a world, and we talk about the world never stops spinning, the clock never stops moving. We think of this world as busy, 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 and it is, and it's true, but that is a consequence of sin. If you think about it, God's creation, when he finished creating on the seventh day, the world was at rest. It was perfect. It was at peace. We catch a glimpse of this when we go out into nature and we sit and we're still and we see the clouds and the blue sky and we hear the wind through the trees. Maybe we hear the waves on the shore. But then, caw, caw, caw! There's a crow that ruins it all. Or there's a bug flying in our face. Or we hear the neighbor's dog barking. Or in our case, the neighbor's legalized air pollution floats over the fence and we smell the skunk. Creation is no longer at peace and rest. But on the Sabbath, when we stop, when we be still, when we rest, we recall God's perfect creation which was once at rest that was lost to humanity's sin and that only God can restore. And restoring it, he is doing. Because the Sabbath ties to a second major work of God. Besides creating, the other is redeeming. God's major work of redemption. He is redeeming creation. He has redeemed us. And for the Israelites, he redeemed them from literal slavery. They were at work all the time as slaves. Their Egyptian masters told them when to get up, when to work, when to stop working, when to eat, when to rest. And God rescued them from that and gave them freedom 
And he said, six days you shall work, but the seventh day you'll rest. And you'll rest and you'll spend time with me. Because I'm not some distant, far-off God that you have to appease. I am your creator. I am your redeemer. I am your savior, your Lord, your father, your friend. So the first aspect of the Sabbath is resting and spending time with God. The second aspect of the Sabbath is another way that we keep it holy, and that's through worship. Being in worship, not just by ourselves, but with others. With this eternal family that God has called us to be a part of. We do that on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings, but if you're busy on the weekend, you can still watch the recording of our live stream. You can invite a friend over, watch it with family. You can still be together with us. It doesn't have to be on a particular day. Luther's explanation of the third commandment that we said earlier was we should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching in His Word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. But how many of us at some point or another in our lives have referred to the sermon as the boring part or the long part? We've taught it to our kids who've grown up to despise it. We don't sit there and listen to some guy talk for 15, 20, 25 minutes. And believe me, I've been there. I've sat through a lot of boring sermons. And frankly, there's no excuse for a boring sermon. God's Word is living and active and powerful, and it applies to our lives right now. But if we decide going in that the sermon is boring, it doesn't matter how exciting or applicable it is if we've already set our minds against it. You remember the early church was so hungry for God's Word that they would spend all day listening to Paul preach, even to the point of falling asleep and falling out a window and dying because they didn't want to go home. The Sabbath. It's our day of worship. Here we start our day, our week with worship on Sunday, the first day of the week. Although, realistically, is Sunday the first day of the week? On the calendar, Sunday is the first day of the week, but how do we live? Sunday is what we call the week end. We don't start our week on Sunday. We start it on Monday. We get a case of the Mondays. The fact that Sunday is listed as the first day on our calendar is antiquated. It's outdated. It goes all the way back to when we were an agricultural society, pre-slavery, pre-civil war. And we hang on to that vestige. Why? I don't know. It's kind of like daylight savings time. Nobody really remembers why we do daylight savings time anymore. And nobody really cares except for those two times a year when we have to change the clocks and everybody gets really bent out of shape and complains about it for two or three days and then it's forgotten for six more months. We cling to these things, but how do we really live? For us in our culture in America, Sunday is the last day of the week and it is in that sense truly the Sabbath day. The Christians in the Bible were the first to start worshiping on Sundays. It didn't happen after the New Testament. It happened in the New Testament. In fact, most, well, all of the original Christians were Jewish converts. And so they observed the Sabbath, Saturday. But the soldiers would come around and they were raiding the Christian churches who met in their homes. And they would raid them on Saturdays to catch them in the act. And so the Christians, in order to survive, started worshiping on Sunday, the Lord's Day, because Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. And you can find multiple examples of that in the Bible. Paul talks about taking the offering, the collection, on the first day of the week so that it's ready when he comes to pick it up. John, the revelator who received his revelation on the island of Patmos, says he received the revelation while he was in the Spirit, while he was worshiping on the Lord's Day, Sunday. It doesn't matter, ultimately, if it's Sunday or Saturday. 
The Seventh-day Adventists insist that we are incorrect for celebrating on Sunday, but they're incorrect because the Bible says our Sabbath rest is in Jesus. In fact, Paul says in Colossians 2, don't let anyone pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And Jesus makes it clear that he is our Sabbath rest. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is our rest until we come to our ultimate and final rest. As Hebrews says, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. And Revelation says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, blessed indeed that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Now, don't let that be an excuse for you to say, I can rest when I'm dead. Workaholism is sinful too. We are still supposed to rest, to stop, be still, and know that he is God. It just means it doesn't have to be on a particular day. But the point is this. We are made in God's image, but we are sinful, fallen creatures. And we cannot just keep going and going and going and going until we die. Or we will die sooner. Even the Energizer Bunny needed his batteries to be changed. They just didn't show that on the commercial. Our problem today is not always with work. Now, there is workaholism where some of us need to stop and work away because some of us have either too high an opinion of ourselves where we think that the place just can't function without us. It can. Or we're running from something else and we're escaping what we have to deal with or should be dealing with. But for most of us, work is not our issue. It's being busy. No matter what we do, whether we work full-time or we're retired, most of us would say, I'm just so busy. Busy, busy, busy. Demands of work, demands of school, demands of our household, but also the demands of our kids, of our grandkids, sports, our phones, binge-watching TV shows until our eyeballs fall out of our heads. We go, go, go without stopping. When we do stop, if we stop, it's to look at our phone. And then we complain that we just don't have enough time. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Ultimately, that is what the third commandment is all about. Stop going and doing and entertaining yourself constantly and keeping yourself busy. Be still. Be silent. Be present. And listen. Let your mind slow down. Let your thoughts stop racing. Reconnect with your Heavenly Father. Now, if you're like me, if you stop, that's when your mind starts racing. I lay down in bed at the end of the day, and then my mind starts thinking through everything. Well, that's a pretty good sign that that's the first time I've stopped and been still all day. Need to do a better job. But if you are successful in stopping and being still and spending time with God, it's likely that you'll fall asleep. And if that happens, it's a pretty fair sign that you are still going too hard. Don't be discouraged. Just do it again. Because I want to remind you, this sermon, these sermons are not about yelling at you. You have to spend more time with God. You have to rest. The Ten Commandments, or better called the Ten Words, 
are descriptive, not prescriptive. They don't tell us what we have to do to stop disappointing God. They tell us who we are. We are a people who, unlike the world around us, takes time to rest and spend time with God. We are a people who need, need hunger to be reconnected to God. But if we never stop going, then we forget about that hunger. And we think we don't need God. There's a video from the skit guys, and in it is a line that I just I have always really clung to and loved. And the, the one guy is talking to God and he says, God, I'm just I'm so sorry I've let you down. And God's response is, No, my child, you were never holding me up. You are God's. It's who you are. You are made in God's image in order to image God to creation. You are the mirror that reflects Him to the world around you. You do not have to go, go, go in order to be good enough. All that stuff that needs to get done, a woman's work is never done. All of that stuff that has to get done, it will never all be done. If you work your way entirely through your list, guess what happens? More stuff comes on that list. There will always be more to do in a sinful, fallen world. There will always be someone disappointed you didn't do more, even if it's yourself or just a voice in your own head. There will always be something more you feel you need to prove, and it will never, ever be enough. But you do not have to live that way. You don't have to prove anything to anyone, not even yourself. Your identity is not wrapped up in your reputation and what other people think of you. Any more than it is tied up in who you vote for, who you are attracted to, or what you do for a living. Those are identifiers. And they are used by a world that is lost and confused to try and give identity. But when you are lost and confused, you get scared. And when you get scared, you get angry. And that's why we live in an angry, angry world because it is lost and confused and scared because it has forgotten who it is. People have forgotten who they are. Don't forget who you are. You are a baptized child of God. You are meant for more than the busyness of a lost and confused and scary and angry life. You were meant to really live. You were given life, and that life was redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. And a big part of living involves stopping, resting, being still, and spending time with the God who loves you who created you, who redeemed you, who wants to be with you. Spending time in worship with the family that God has called you into through the waters of baptism. Being fed by his word and the gifts of his body and blood. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because that's who you are. And I'll see you in church. We stand and sing our offertory.
You may be seated as we graciously respond to God's generosity in our lives by bringing Him our tithes and offerings. Please stand for prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for being our rest. Thank you for renewing in us our strength. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. Help us to know you. And may we remember that you are enough. God, we lift up all of those who are on our hearts and minds right now. For Ken Schlafke, Alan Gerwin, for Jeff Ridholler's mom, Joan, for Jeff himself, who's having surgery on the 11th, Sherry Morgret, surgery on the 10th. God, we lift up all of those who are sick and hurting and recovering or awaiting surgery. Comfort them, keep them, heal them. God, we also mourn with the family and friends of Don Johnson, the wife of Steve, who works here at our Adams campus so faithfully to take care of our grounds and our buildings. Lord, be with Steve and that family. Lift them up in their sorrow. Give them comfort. God, we also ask that you would be with Carol Armbrecht and her husband, Bill, who are undergoing the final processes of moving here to Saginaw permanently packing today and moving truck tomorrow. Give them peace as they travel to their new home and give them safety. God, we also give you thanks for Jim Gladstone back on the organ this morning. It's been a long, long time, at least a couple of weeks, but we're so thankful for him filling in this morning. God, we lift up all of these and all of the things that are unspoken. We lift them up in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this often in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you until life everlasting. Go in his peace. give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ your son our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. Amen. Amen.